Hey friends, welcome to the All Means All podcast. Today is the last part of the seven deadly sins, pride. It's probably one of the ones that births all the others, pride. If you missed any of them, go back and catch them. You can catch them on YouTube. You can catch them on the All Means All podcast. And you can, again, in this Lenten journey, put together, how am I reflecting Christ and not these seven deadly sins? The seven deadly sins. Today we arrive at the seventh sin, pride. Pride. I want to take you to the text immediately. We're going to start with the words of Paul to the church in Philippi, the uh, the book to the Philippians, chapter 2, and verse 5 through 8. And we're going to read these words out loud together. We'll put them up on the screen. Read these holy words with me, would you? Let's read. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think of so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status, no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. Pride, the last of the seven deadly sins. Now, pride has had a bit of a remake, uh, a makeover in the last few years. It's kind of had a, a reboot. And so a lot of us would say, wait a minute, Pastor. We were proud of our kids as they sang. We're proud of the choir as they sang. The big kids, that's you, all right. We're proud of the orchestra. Thank you for being here today. I mean, there's some moments where we go, we're proud of that. We've got pride in our ancestry. Maybe you're a proud Idahoan. I meet people who say, I'm the third, I'm the fifth, I'm the seventh generation Idahoan. Maybe you're a proud West Virginian. Any of those out there today? Just, all right, we got a couple. That's right, there's a, we're everywhere, look out. Some of us are proud of our alma mater. I mean, we love the school where we learned and gave our life. Proud of our children and grandchildren. Proud of our neighbor. Proud of our church. Well, where does pride become a sin? When does it cross over the line? Jeff Cook, in his book, The Deadly Sins and the Beatitudes, writes this. Pride is the natural love for self and a perverted disdain for others. Now, it creeps into church people about the time we try to leave the parking lot. (laughs) Right, when you're like, oh, come on, go! (laughs) Pride, pride's when you're driving down the interstate and you wonder, where did all these idiots come from? (laughs) Pride. Now, this is going to be a little bit interactive today, so get your hands ready. Put down your coffee. Quit Googling. All right. You ready? Get your hands out. We're going to slap our our thighs twice, like one, two, and then clap. So ready? In rhythm. Oh, this is good. You know what comes next? We will, we will rock you. One more time. You got it. Let's hear your choir. We will rock you. All right, you can stop right there. Keep that, keep that rhythm, that wording in the back of your mind. Pride is what happens when our team's playing. Even if your mom's rooting for the other team, you look at your mother and go, we will rock you. <laughs> Pride. It can take over so much that we no longer see the other as a child of God. Pride. The opposite of pride is humility. And on Palm Sunday, there's a dance between pride and humility that takes place. Pilate was the Roman governor in the time of Jesus. Many of you have traveled to Israel and you've been to Caesarea Maritime. That's just about 60 miles north of, of Jerusalem. And you right there on the edge of the sea, a beautiful location. And it's the remnants of where Pilate's 
palace was. He spent most of his time in Caesarea Maritime, but he came to Jerusalem a few times a year when he needed to keep the peace. Passover was one of those times when Jews from all over Galilee and Judea came together in Jerusalem and they remembered God as a rescuing God, God as a liberating God, God who sets us free. You better believe the occupying power wants to be around to remind you, we will rock you. Cross the line and we will rock you. Pilate came not as a pilgrim, he was present not as a reminder of God's presence, but as a symbol of power. He came to keep the peace, to keep the existing arrangement, to keep the occupying authority and power. When Pilate came to town, folks understood. It was more than a royal procession. It was, it was a military parade, a parade, a visual display of imperial power, Calvary. Foot soldiers, leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on the pole. There would be the creaking of leather, the sounding of feet, sound of feet marching in the streets, the beating of drums, the dust as a reminder of who's in charge. Rome, the occupier. We will rock you. It was not just a display of imperial power, but really imperial worship and imperial theology for as we come to town in power, we would remind you that Caesar is God. One of his titles, the son of God. Caesar is God. Pride. The seven deadly sins we've journeyed through during these 40 days, pride and envy, anger, Sloth, greed, gluttony, and lust. These were sins that were discovered when people tried to live a monastic life, when they were living withdrawn from the community. They said, these are the things that get in our way of being fully God. Can you imagine? We're all wearing the same garb. We're all eating the same food. We're sleeping in the same kind of cell. And yet we say there's still things that get in our way of being fully God's like our pride, wow. Rebecca DeYoung in her book, Glittering Vices, says this, the great vices all make the list of seven because they pretend to fulfill the deepest and most significant of human desires. Pride is a cheap substitute for the true human desire to be profoundly known and to be profoundly loved, pride. This parade of pilots, you might say, is a pride parade. Now that may give you a whole different image when you think of a pride parade. And I would say, hold that thought. And if you want to go down that road, one of my colleagues, Jeremy Smith, wrote a sermon two years ago called The First Palm Sunday Was a Drag Show. <laughs> and it's a great sermon. He reminds us that from the gospel writing in Mark that, that it's as if the, uh, the apostles looked at the, the powerful energy coming from Rome and went, we're going to just make fun of you. You come on a, a war horse, we'll put our guy on a donkey. Just Google it if you want to read the whole thing. Or if this sermon isn't working for you, Google it. <laughs> William Barber III, one of the conveners of the Poor People's Campaign for Workers' Rights, he reminds us that Rome had two primary classes of people. One called the humiliators, the humiliated ones, what a terrible name. And the other called the honesterias, the honored ones. He writes that the honored ones were the ones that had the wealth and power and dynasties. They flaunted and boasted in their entourages, their dress, their education. They're probably the ones that tried to get Pilate's eye as he came to town to say, we're here, we're with you. They lived in excess while the humiliated ones 
the fishermen, the carpenters, the masons, the stonemasons, the farmers, the shepherds, the women, and the children, and they hung out in Galilee. The honored ones flaunted their power. The humiliated ones never would have power. Pride. There were two parties, most scholars say, that day. Two parades. One parade came in from the west, from Caesarea Philippi. And one came in from the east, where Jesus traveled in. That triumphal entry of Jesus to Jerusalem is the start of what we call Holy Week. It's that journey from triumph to tragedy that inspires, provokes, and challenges our reality. Jesus travels just 15 miles from Jericho. Jericho, one of the lowest cities in the world, he travels up to Jerusalem. And as he travels, the gospels tell us, he preaches, he heals the sick, he teaches about the kingdom of God. They get near the city of Bethany. Some of you have been there just on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And Luke puts it like this in chapter 19. Jesus addresses a couple of the disciples and says, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter, you will find a cold tide there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, just say the Lord needs it. So they did just what Jesus said. They found the colt. They brought it to Jesus. Jesus rode the colt toward Jerusalem and folks spread their garments on the ground in front of him. John puts it like this in the gospel of John chapter 12. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him and they shouted. Let's read the shout. Read it with me. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. It's hard for us to understand how shocking that shout is. Save us. Save us. I mean, maybe it's the cry that should go up for, from us when our legislature's in town. Save us. Maybe it's the cry that should go up as we watch our world dissolve. Save us. Maybe it's what we should do in the face of all the isms of our world is say, save us. Stop taking away the rights of women. Stop taking away the rights of trans youth. Save us. Now you know why Pilate went to town. We will rock you. This is a dangerous moment. As Jesus rode this donkey into town and what we often think of as a children's parade, I I think the people remembered the prophet Zechariah, at least Jesus did. The prophet Zechariah who wrote in chapter nine, verse nine, shout and cheer, daughter of Zion, raise the roof, daughter Jerusalem. Your king is coming, a good king who makes all things right, a humble king riding on a donkey, a mere colt of a donkey. I've had it with war. No more chariots and Ephraim, no more war horses in Jerusalem, no more swords and spears and bows and arrows, no more semi-automatic weapons. He will offer peace to the nations, a peaceful rule worldwide from the four corners to the seven seas. Jesus understood this text and he lives right into this text as he marches into Jerusalem. I'm sure there were some in the crowd though that go, but uh, Jesus, there are other texts. Jesus, don't you remember Jeremiah chapter 20? The Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. Don't you remember that one, Jesus? Jesus, don't you remember the Psalms? God will crush the heads of your enemies. Or how about Isaiah, the prophet, Jesus? Don't you remember the Lord will march like a hero? He will come like a warrior. Why don't you come like that? Jesus knew who he was and knew where he came from. And you remember the first text we read in Philippians? He chose to humble himself. Wow. Palm Sunday is a protest parade. 
mean, Jesus comes on a donkey declaring peace, not with chariots or war horses, not with military might, but with humility. He comes in peace. His actions shout, I've had it with war. His actions shout, ban assault weapons. His actions shout, choose second graders, not the second amendment. Wow. And some of us look at Jesus and think, you're a kino. You're a king in name only. The prophet, the writer Verna Dozer writes in her book, The Dream of God. Jesus announced that the kingdom of God had come with him and he offered another possibility to humankind. But since it's another possibility, that threatens the existing arrangement. The existing arrangement will bend every effort to destroy it, to water it down, water it down with religion or threaten it with disloyalty. When one threatens the existing arrangement, even with peace, the existing arrangement will do whatever it can, whatever it can to destroy that threat. Palm Sunday is a protest parade It was not the man Jesus that upset Rome. It was not the religious arrangement. It was the announcement of another possibility. Peace. Pilate will understand this possibility. The Sanhedrin will get this possibility. In the last week of Jesus' life, this protest challenging the existing arrangement is exactly what gets him killed. When gradual change is called for, we call it progress. But when radical change is called for, we say, ah, that's, that's dangerous, pastor. That's revolution. It's the kind of change that threatens most of us in positions of power and privilege. Oh, how we wish Jesus would have just talked about heaven and not about bringing heaven on earth. We love a Jesus that saves us and that gives us eternal life but we struggle with living the kingdom of God on earth as in heaven. We struggle living God-centered lives with Jesus' teachings. Really, Jesus? Love your enemy? Really, if you have two coats, give one away? What if we have eight? Visit the prisoner? Turn the other cheek? Put down the sword. You Really, you want us to ban assault weapons? We often divorce Jesus from his teaching. And for 17 centuries, Christianity's offered us a gospel where we can accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and largely ignore everything he taught about peace, violence, and human society. We've embraced a privatized gospel that gives us a cool savior but ignores the kingdom of God. Tony Campalo was with us years ago, a great storyteller, great preacher. Tony was here, and I love this line from Tony. He said, we're willing to be Christian to a point, to the point where it starts to mess with our lives, to the point where it pushes our politics, to the point where it messes with our wallet, to the point where it changes our behavior. We're willing to be Christian to a point. Can't we just have a Palm Sunday pastor and celebrate the children and, and just be happy? The kingdom of God has always connected people who were different, who's theology was different, whose politics were different. When Jesus gathered 12 people to build the peaceable kingdom of God, he chose Simon the Zealot to be one of the 12. Simon who who carries a sword with him in hopes of insurrection. Simon who would have been at the Capitol on January 6th. Simon who believes you win by fighting. Jesus said, follow me. He said to Matthew, Matthew, a Jew who maybe said, you know, maybe this Jewish stuff isn't working well for me. I 
if you can't beat them, join them. I'll, I could be a tax collector. I could at least take in the profits of the enemy and maybe keep a little for myself. Jesus says to the sympathizer, who, for the one who says, I'll do the best that I can and make my way, come and follow me. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, who says, you know what? I think the world's gone to hell. I'm going to withdraw out in the desert. I'm not going to do religion like my parents in Jerusalem. I'm going to do it on my own. If people want religion, they can come to me. Jesus says, no, no, come, come and follow me. To a sympathizer, to a zealot, to an isolationist, Jesus says, come and follow me. We are called into this protest parade. It's uncomfortable. Some of you would say, I I'm not wired for protest. Some of us would say, that seems like it's all we do. We are called into this protest parade to say, women should have the same rights about health care as I do. We are called into this protest parade. The parents of trans youth should have the same rights for health care as parents of religion that can choose to not offer health care. We are called into this protest parade. Palm Sunday. Pride. Let me give you a couple action steps today. Invitations. I'm going to invite you to join. Join the parade. Next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we'll start a new series. We're not doing seven deadly sins on Easter, just so you know. If you missed one, you'll have to pick up the podcast. So uh, we will begin a series on joy. Joy. So I invite you to bring a friend, invite a neighbor. Remember, show them where you sit. Tell them what door to come in, how to meet you. Remember all the different parking options from behind us to across the street. Those three lots are ours. The grass lot will be open on Easter. Maybe come a little early, maybe carpool together. Let's make room for others. If you're able to park further away and let those who have children or those who need to park close, park close. Leave those spaces for those who can. Join the parade. Join the parade and care for others as we continue to support our food pantry. Every Monday at the Amity campus, the food pantry is open and there are just basic needs that we try to fill things like canned meats and cereal and there was a list in your email. If you didn't get the email, look, stop at the front desk and they can probably help you out. Join the parade. For 40 days of Lent, we have tried to get rid of 40 things. 40 pieces of clothing, 40 tools, 40 books, 40 fill in the blank. Something that we go, we've got too much of that. And we can release it back into the community because it still has some value. Maybe drop it off at your favorite charity at Goodwill or maybe find a place to say, I want to release this, not so I can gain more, but so my life can be a little more simple. Let's pray. God, thank you for this holy moment. This Passover, we remember that you are rescuing God. You meet us right where we are. You hear our cries. And we, like the people of old, we cry, Hosanna, save us. Meet us right here in this world that we are tempted to continue to destroy. Meet us right here in, these, in our lives where we hunger for more of you. Meet us right here in the tension of our realities that we might be a church where all really does mean all, young and old and rich and poor and black and white and gay and straight and Republicans and Democrats. We can live in the tension of our differences because your love is so great and your mercy so grand. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Hey friends, thanks for listening to the All Means All podcast. I want to share one thing with you. I need you to pray about this event coming up in April, April 26th, 27th. 
is the Northwest Leadership Institute. I want you to pray about it because laity and clergy will come and maybe God's calling you to be present. You can come be present if you're here in the valley. You can fly in and join the, the excitement and the team that's there or you can even join us online. Information's on the website. Go to cathedralofthe-rockies.org. Scroll down, you'll find a, a link to NLI, Northwest Leadership Institute, and then join us. If you can't be with us, be with us in spirit as laity and clergy come together to dream what the church could be.